We are back with another Cardano native token tier list. And if you thought that we got rid of all of the good projects in the first part, think again. Let's talk about it. Welcome to Late Game Crypto. My name is Josh, and I'm here to help you find digital liberty in the complex world of crypto. Remember that anything you hear in any of my videos is not to be taken as financial advice. Do your own research and own your own decisions. So part one turned out actually about as well as I expected. Normally, what I'll try to do in my videos is pretty much keep most of my criticisms to myself. Instead, I try to express principles in my videos, and you can decide if you think that they're good or not. You will adopt them, and then we'll see where that takes you. But apparently... Crypto is just filled with a bunch of uh, sadists that thrive on FUD and drama. <laughs> That's not really what I do here, but for the sake of this series, I'll step out my comfort zone for a little while and give you some honest criticisms and feedback about where I think all of these projects stand fundamentally. Just like in part one, I'm using an aggregated criteria of team member experience, token utility, community, marketing capability, and the value for decentralization. So let's dive into it. This first one is actually a really interesting one because the whole system of wallet providers, of hot wallet providers, those services that are offered, it's an ironically centralized business model. In order to get access to crypto and actually hold and own any crypto assets, you have to go through a wallet service provider. But the, nobody's figured out a way to decentralize that business model so that there's actually revenue sharing, so that there's actually a, a, a governance model where people get to dictate the decisions of how a wallet is run. This is what Jira Wallet does. I don't know how many people actually realize that this is the case, but in order for wallets to actually make money, they do charge you a service fee for every transaction that you run on a wallet. At least that's how most of them work. Now, granted, it's not a very profitable business right now because the amount that they charge is actually extremely tiny. And, uh, you know, we're barely coming out of the bear market right now, uh, arguably still in the bear market, depending on who you ask. So, no, like none of these wallet providers are flushed with cash and, and taking all of this money for themselves. But my point is that there's no forward thinking projects that are out there trying to do what Jira Wallet is actually taking steps to do. And the, they're the only ones that actually seem to get it. So not only are they the most decentralized hot wallet solution, but they're also the most secure hot wallet solution, at least in the entire Cardano space. They're the only one that has had their smart contracts audited. They're the only one that has a cybersecurity expert dedicated on their team. They're the only one that actually takes security as seriously as like an industrial level financial product. They're so passionate about security that they've actually taken steps to create a whole company around that security to be able to provide people outside of Jira Wallet with security tools so that they know what they're getting into. And that is Cardano Shield, which is actually integrated directly into the Jira Wallet. Now, I just said plenty of good things about it because I'm passionate about this project. I am actually technically an ambassador for them. They don't, they don't pay me anything for that role, but... I still care about this project specifically because I believe in its principles. I believe in what it's doing. I believe in its uniqueness and the high quality value that they bring to the table that is so separate from the rest of the Cardano ecosystem. But still, I do end up landing this one in the B tier. Now, I have consistently made videos about Jira Wallet, and I've said more than once that I think this project is going to 100x in this next bull market, and I still think that's true. It might be the only B tier token that, uh, that I do still believe is going to 100x in this next bull market because it's a $3 million market cap. It might be the only token in the Cardano ecosystem that doesn't even have to come close to reaching its previous all-time high in order to 100x. It, it, it only has to hit like a... $300 million market cap in order to 100x. It's going to be that easy in order to do it. 
But the problem is that the Jira Wallet team is a very small team. There's only a handful of experts that are behind this, and they're very talented people, but it's uh, it's not enough to really get the word out there. And I'm not sure that they have a, a dedicated marketing specialist, which is another reason that this project falls in the B tier, because I don't think that they have uh, enough uh, dedicated marketing talent to put the time into actually getting the word out there about this project. And there would be an extreme change of their circumstances if they did actually look like they were going to be moving to expand cross-chain anytime soon. But I doubt that that's going to happen this next bull market, which means that it probably won't be able to take advantage of any of those cross-chain benefits, of getting exposure to any of these other communities, which means that they're going to have to wait for people to come to them. Now, Jira Wallet is one of my top long-term plays because I do believe in the talent behind this team. I believe that they can accomplish the vision they have set out for them, and uh, the things that they're going to accomplish are going to exceed industry standards of quality. So they're going somewhere. They are going to be around, and they've proven that they will continue to work on their product even though they're really not getting paid for any of it at all. Uh, it's, it's a quality project driven by passion, driven by principle, and it's going to do well. It's just that they fall behind in a lot of areas. So that's why I land where I land. Somebody in the part one video had uh, thrown a comment into the comment section talking about how there should be a god tier for Cornucopius. And while I would agree with that, uh, I think even more so, this applies to World Mobile Token. I'm actually just going to go ahead and stick it in the S tier here because it is, it should be so obvious that it lands at the top tier of projects in this ecosystem that it, it really shouldn't even be a question. That the, If anybody's going to jump into the comments and try to debate me that World Mobile does not belong in the S tier, I, I'm going to have some serious questions about your integrity. World Mobile Token is probably going to be one of the biggest beneficiaries in this next bull market of the D-Pin narrative. And even if that weren't the case, they are entering a $2 trillion market, arguably the largest market on the planet that isn't fragmented like the finance market is. And the guys behind this team have massive telecoms experience. They have done this before. They know what they're doing. They have connections in the industry. They're going to make this happen. When people on social media ask me what real world value does Cardano offer to the world? And one of the examples that I give to them is that there are thousands of people in Africa right now that now have internet access because Cardano exists, because the World Mobile team made it happen. Now, I have a general rule of thumb for Cardano native projects that uh, I think are gonna perform best in this next bull market. Because Cardano has been so uh, sort of isolationist over this past, well, well really four years, uh, because, like, there is this narrative that that Cardano doesn't have anything building on it. People are actively not looking at the ecosystem because people are telling them that. This has been the case for the past couple of years. So, Cardano native projects have to be able to go out there and create value, either by expanding cross-chain and getting exposure to greater audiences, or they have to create value in external markets. And this is much more where World Mobile lives. I mean, not only is World Mobile creating value in external markets, but they're also creating creating the external market. They are paying attention to people that these major telecoms companies have ignored for the longest time because it's not worth them pursuing. But because World Mobile very uniquely has cheaper infrastructure than the rest of the industry does, they've got a major advantage going into creating these markets and providing services to people around the world that are currently unconnected. World Mobile is sitting on a $170 million market cap, which is pretty low for a lot of the crypto space, but uh, I'm hesitant to say that this one is going to 100x from here. Uh, it could still happen, but I think that uh, the, the 100x mark has kind of passed us by this point, and, and it'll probably still 100x from where it was a few weeks ago. Uh, this one's going to perform well. I think that it's almost guaranteed. I, I have the utmost confidence 
in this project, but it is still a pretty high market cap. So uh, as far as as uh, my prediction for open market performance here, um, I obviously think that it's going to do well, but I don't think it's going to do as well a lot of these nano cap projects will. The next project on our list is MELD, and I know this is a controversial one for a lot of the Cardano folks, but here's the thing. Decentralized crypto to fiat does not exist, not in a decentralized fashion. If it has fiat, most likely it's not decentralized. If it, it deals in like crypto to crypto lending and borrowing, then it can be decentralized, but nobody's been able to bridge that gap in a truly decentralized way. Not only that, but there are products that Meld has created, like the Genius Loan, that doesn't exist anywhere. Well, it exists in one place that I know of, but it's only a crypto-to-crypto -crypto context. So the Genius Loan doesn't actually exist in a crypto-to-fiat context, which is an absolutely major, huge value proposition. Meld was one of the first projects in the entire Cardano ecosystem to take the stance on that cross-chain narrative, and they've taken the most steps to be able to make that happen. They are out there and accessible on different blockchains, and all of their products are coming together, and, and the Meld token actually represents ownership over the protocol. So it, it actually, the utility for it actually means something of value. Meld is currently sitting on a $55 million market cap, which I think is absolutely wild given its value propositions, but really this has kind of everything to do with the split sentiment in the Cardano ecosystem. But once their products actually go live, which is right around the corner, their testnet looks incredible. Once it actually goes live on the mainnet, these tokens are going to be available to people on other blockchains, and $55 million is freaking nothing when it comes to mainstream crypto. People are looking for the most amazing picks under $100 million. So when they see that Meld is sitting $55 million or close to $100 million, they're going to jump on that opportunity given what it is that they have created. I really don't have anything majorly bad to say about Meld. They have made mistakes, yes, but a lot of the, the bad things that critics have to say against Meld really doesn't have anything to do with the honest truth about where Meld is at and what Meld is doing as a team. It seems a lot like it really just has to do with the fact that Meld hasn't launched their lending and borrowing products on the Cardano mainnet, which there are legitimate reasons for. So I am putting Meld in the S category. I understand that they have taken a long time to build their products, but when you're building things that haven't been built before, given that crypto to fiat bridge and the decentralized nature of those mechanisms, of course it's going to take a long time. It takes a long time to build things that don't exist. Now let's take a look at Endmaker, which is legitimately an S-tier platform. Cardano would not be where it's at today if it were not for Endmaker. They have minted, I want to say something close to 70%, maybe more, of all of the NFTs that have minted on Cardano, which is massive. The problem that I have is that Endmaker is a, it's, it's a legit quality product that has done a lot for the space, but the token was created pretty long after the Endmaker platform has been live and providing services to people in the ecosystem, and, and maybe it's just that I don't understand the uh, utility proposition of it, but I, I land it in the C tier. The only understandable utility that I actually kind of get is the staking mechanism, but it seems like you... you you mint NFTs through their services so that you can earn Endmaker. And then what you can do with those Endmaker tokens is stake them so that you can earn more Endmaker so that so that you can stake more of it. I just I don't I don't understand what value is created with it. In in all of the literature that I have scoured through, it doesn't seem like you can pay for services with the Endmaker token. It doesn't seem like the Endmaker token enables any service discounts or anything like that. Uh, it seems to me like you can use the Endmaker platform in its full capacity without ever touching the Endmaker token, which I think is, is a, a good thing. Like, I think that the quality of your services should not be blocked by a token, but uh, that also raises the question of what the heck is the point of the token? I absolutely respect 
people that try to go out and create value without actually getting compensated for it. That's what I try to do on this YouTube channel. And the only time that I ever actually make any money is if my viewers go and sign up for products like they have over at iTrust Capital with their 401k products and IRAs that you can actually invest into some of the top cryptocurrencies in the industry. Even when it comes to those kinds of uh, promotional opportunities, I don't like to partner with any crypto projects. And I do like to partner with projects that do have uh, more perks for my viewers. Like if you use my affiliate link down in the description below, you can get $100 towards your first account with iTrust Capital. It's free money. You may as well take advantage of it. Uh, and, and let's get back to this video. I'm a little fuzzy on the details about how you obtain this Seaplanes NFT distributed by Endmaker, uh, but from what I kind of remember is that you can stake your Endmaker tokens in order to obtain this NFT, which does come with some perks when it comes to utilizing the Endmaker services. Uh, so there is some kind of indirect connection there, but also you could just buy the NFT directly, I'm pretty sure, and uh, never have to touch the Endmaker token. So what's the value of anybody actually buying the Endmaker token off of the open market? Now, there was a recent article that actually came out that talked about the buyback and burn mechanism that Endmaker has implemented, but it's only for a limited five month period of time which uh, isn't gonna make much of a substantial impact. The buyback and burn mechanism is very much a long-term thing that actually allows a token to scale with the success of the services offered on the platform. That's the whole point of the buyback and burn thing. But uh, if it's limited like this, then that's not actually going to be the case in the long-term of the Endmaker token. My whole perception of this system that Endmaker has created around this token would change completely if this buyback and burn mechanism was permanent, because that would mean that a portion of the revenue is actually going into the Endmaker token, and that's creating buy pressure that actually scales with the services that are being utilized on the Endmaker platform. But since it's so limited, I, I don't see that buy pressure actually making any legitimate impact in a five month period. Currently, this token is sitting on an $8 million market cap, which is pretty extremely low, and it probably will perform relatively well when altcoin season comes around, just because it's a big recognizable name. But in all honestly, I, I, I don't feel like Endmaker needs a token, which is why I land it in the C tier. The next token on our list is the Hunt token by the Dex Hunter team. And when this product went live on the main yet, it, it made a splash. Lots of people were talking about the Dex Hunter protocol, which I was actually kind of surprised about because uh, Dex aggregators are not really anything new in the Cardano ecosystem. There have been three or four Dex aggregators that were built and executed on the Cardano mainnet before Dex Hunter ever came around. Dex Hunter is, uh, bar none, the best one out of all of them, but uh, I, I was surprised that people went as crazy with it as they did when, when it was uh, launching on the mainnet. Now, I have a few problems with the utility of the Hunt token. Uh, starting with the fact that they're kind of contradicting utilities. Like the whole appeal behind the Hunt token is the expectation that people will buy the token so that they can get the utilities that it activates on the Dex Hunter protocol. But they're very small scale utilities that uh, you don't really need a ton of Hunt token in order to activate a, a lot of them. And uh, they, they contradict the value proposition of it. For example, the first utility is the fact that you get discounted fees on the Dex Hunter protocol, but fees are determined by the company as a whole. They are established by the team. So either the fees are so huge that the, the token utility is actually highly desirable, or the fees are relatively minimal, in which case it doesn't really call for a need for the Dex tokens. You see that contradiction there. Now, based on where the price of ADA is at right now, uh, and the projected uh, price of, of where I expect ADA to go in this next bull market, I think that we're more on the side of the fact that the fees 
aren't really all that expensive on Dex Hunter, uh, which means that this utility isn't really something that adds any desirability to the hunt token. Um, and I don't know if that their fees are ever going to change or adjust into the future as the price of ADA goes up, but uh, I think that would be a pretty poor move. So I, I think that this utility isn't really going to be something that's considerable, uh, at least for a few years. And then the second utility is the fact that you get faster trades, the more hunt tokens that you own, which is kind of a cool concept in theory, but it also means that they are holding back their best. The Dex Hunter protocol that the public gets access to is not the best product that it could be. It's not the fastest thing that it could be. They're holding back the fastest that they have to offer unless you spend a bunch of money on their tokens. But that also means that the general public that's utilizing this product isn't going to be experiencing the product at their best. What you get uh, as a open, open public user of it is a, a subpar quality product. This is just my opinion, but it is coming from experience. I've used the Dex Hunter protocol before, and it is noticeably slower without using Hunt tokens, and I have multiple wallets that I want to be able to trade with, so I'm not going to be able to hold a bunch of Hunt tokens in all of those different wallets, uh, so I just don't use Dex Hunter because it's, it's noticeably slower than any other uh, protocol that I would use. Maybe I'd be able to save some money on, on some fees, but I'm not making any substantially larger trades. And uh, the point that I'm getting at here is that a massive amount of people are not going to be using the hunt protocol. It's just going to be a small number of people that are going to buy a bunch of these hunt tokens so that they can get access to the best product that is available. And, and that's why this token probably won't be looking at a major ridiculous run in this next bull market. The last real utility that this token offers is you get access to premium features, which in my opinion is probably the biggest value proposition that this token has to offer. There are no revenue sharing mechanisms behind this token, which means that even if a massive amount of people utilize this service, utilize this protocol, it's it's not really going to matter because the the success of the protocol does not scale with the price of the token. There's no connection there. Even if it's the most successful thing that the world has ever seen and everybody on the planet uses Dex Hunter, the token price could still in theory stay at a absolute bare minimum because those things are not connected. Now this one does fulfill my criteria of going and establishing value cross-chain, but cross-chain is on their roadmap for Q4 of 2024. And it's questionable whether or not that might be too late to be able to establish some real exposure to greater markets, or if they're gonna need some time once they get there, if they actually can stay on time with the roadmap. Uh, once they get there, are they actually gonna be able to convince people that their utilities are something that are worth buying? And that's already a question that I, I don't really feel optimistic about. It's a $17 million market cap right now, which is next to nothing, so I can say relatively confidently that I don't think that this token will be going lower. Uh, I do think that it will appreciate in this next bull market, specifically because it's so low, but uh, I don't think that it's going to be a huge mega winner in this next bull market. So that's ultimately why I end up landing the hunt token in the B tier, because it, it just doesn't seem like they have big enough scaling utilities to actually see real success in this token. The next token on our list is the Sunday token from the Sunday Swap protocol. When I do fundamentals breakdowns of different projects in my videos, I, I often bring up this scenario a lot, where if a product is built perfectly, it's built amazing in every which way of conceiving it, but nobody knows about it, the token's not really gonna go anywhere. And, and when I say that, I'm typically thinking about Sunday Swap. Sunday Swap is built perfectly, not, not literally perfectly. In the realm of software and when humans are involved, perfect isn't actually uh, possible. It's, I, I don't literally mean perfect. But what I mean is 
The tokenomics, they are incredibly well designed. It's very decentralized. They've got revenue sharing models that are, that are built into it so that the success of the token actually scales with the success of the product. They've got a highly capable team of incredibly talented developers. They're built on principle. They, they're doing everything right. They've got innovative products that are better. They, they are built better than a lot of DEXs that are available in the ecosystem right now. I would argue that it's better than MinSwap. It can be faster than MinSwap. The problem is that it just doesn't really have a lot of liquidity on the platform so that it can facilitate a higher volume of trading. Sunday Swap doesn't have a marketing team, at least that I'm aware of that they have listed uh, on, on LinkedIn or on their main website. There's no marketing experts that are dedicated to getting the word out there, that are dedicated to talking about this product nonstop, that are actually like trying to get information out in, in publications, out in the world to get people's attention here. Um, and, and it's also not cross-chain, so they're not able to take advantage of any of the greater audiences outside of crypto, which means that they have to wait for people to come to Cardano through those cross-chain projects or through projects that get on centralized exchanges. They have to wait for them to come to SundaySwap, and, and in all that waiting, there are other DEXs that are out there that are getting attention that people will go to first. Uh, it's, it's a $17 million market cap, which, you know, is, oh no, I'm sorry. It's a $9 million market cap, which is even closer to zero than, than the hunt token is. Uh, so I don't think that it's going to depreciate. I don't think that it's going to perform negatively, but, uh, I, I, I'm also not confident that this one's going to take off in the same degree that a lot of other projects will. I have nothing bad to say about the quality of the product. I have nothing bad to say about how the product is built. It's it's all there. It has everything that I'm looking for. It is perfect except for a, a marketing team, except for the people. It lacks that that connection to people, to be able to draw people in. It lacks that attention. And and that's going to be really hard for them going into this next bull market, which is why I end up landing it in the B tier. Uh, hold up now. There we go. In the B tier. The next token on this list is the GENS token from Genius Yield. And this may surprise a lot of people, but I actually rank this one in the A tier. This is a powerful platform, and it's really simple utility for people to understand. It, it makes sense. It's built well. They've created a bunch of innovative products, and it actually connects to the GENS token, unlike a lot of what we see in crypto. 20% of all of the fees that are generated on the Genius Yield platform, not just the DEX, but all of the other products that they have available in their platform, those go, those rewards go to people that are staking GENS tokens. But it doesn't all go to those stakers in the form of GENS tokens. Uh, it, I mean, it does generate some GENS tokens, but like you get the yield of, of fees that are paid in those different Cardano native tokens. So GENS stakers can get a passive income of different Cardano native tokens, including World Mobile and MELD tokens and Jiro tokens. And, and I'm not sure if they have any other DEX tokens that are supported on the protocol, but the point is that you can get a, a nice round package of a lot of different Cardano native tokens just by staking GENS tokens, which is kind of genius if you think about it, because it lowers the weight of the amount of GENS tokens that you reward to, to your community, which means that the dilution is, is going much slower than it would on other platforms, which means scarcity is still very much at play here. And you get a package of all of the Cardano native tokens in the ecosystem. At least people that are interacting with this platform, you, you get a, a package of those. So you kind of get the best of everything. Uh, it's it's very simple utility there, and I think that's that's something that a lot of uh, a, a lot of risk minded people will will be very attracted to because they don't have to pick one Cardano native token or a few Cardano native tokens. They can accumulate a bunch of them. They just have to own a bunch of GENS tokens so that they can slowly accumulate a, a little bit of everything. 
Now, here's the thing, though. Uh, the Genius Yield platform, as far as I'm aware, doesn't have any intentions to expand cross-chain, which means this one will also have to wait for people to come to them after they have come into the Cardano ecosystem through cross-chain projects or other projects that have actually been listed on centralized exchanges. So it may be a struggle for this one. It'll come later, but it's a $6 million market cap. I mean, it's, it's so extraordinarily low and such a powerful utility that it's, it's just, it's, it's kind of a, a simple value proposition here. I do expect it to do really well. A $6 million market cap means that it doesn't have to go crazy. It just has to go to like a $600 million market cap, which isn't really that high, in order to 100x. So that's that's pretty powerful. The next project token that we're breaking down is the ViFi token from the Vi Finance Protocol, which is the DEX that everybody loves to hate on, uh, which... I mean, I get it. Like, it's it's a relatively slow DEX, but, I mean, they're still using Plutus V1 scripts. They've been around longer than a lot of these other projects have, and they have a pretty small team. For what they have accomplished with the team that they have, it is incredibly impressive. They have innovated, they have created, invented more different smart contracts, more protocols, more services than just about any other product in the Cardano ecosystem. It is revolutionary tech. They, they still, I think, are the top uh, B2B staking service in the crypto space, or at least for the Cardano ecosystem. Um, I, I, I want to say that they're not the top NFT stack, staking platform, but they are for DeFi protocols, uh, and, and that's pretty huge. There are a lot of firsts under ViFi's belt. They have built multiple things that have been firsts in the Cardano ecosystem, so they're very cutting edge. They're very, uh, uh, they're out there inventing crap in the Cardano ecosystem, and they haven't stopped. They're still building stuff. They're still building things that we've never seen in DeFi, let alone on Cardano. It's, it's revolutionary tech legitimately, and the tokenomics that they have developed is legitimately top level. I, I haven't seen tokenomics anywhere that I like as much as Vi Finance. People who think they know what they're talking about like to criticize that Vi-Fi has such a huge, fully diluted market cap, but that diluted market cap is not going to hit the market for like 50 years. It's ridiculous. The amount of drip that comes out into the open market every single year, and they're behind. They're actually behind on their dilution schedule, so it's even scarcer than you think that it is. And there's no possible way that any of this uh, amount of token could just be dumped on the community by surprise. It is going to be a slow 50-year drip. It's going to take forever for these tokens to come out, and the $3 million market cap that it's sitting at right now is so stupid, extraordinarily low for the amount of innovation that this team has brought to the ecosystem. I am putting the Wi-Fi token if uh, this thing can stop unfreezing, there we go. I'm putting the ViFi token in the A tier, and I'll tell you why. Uh, ViFi doesn't uh, go cross-chain. They're, they're not, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. They are going to be trading cross-chain, but their protocols, as far as I'm aware, are not going to extend to multiple blockchains. But the reason that I put it in the A tier is because they, they do fit my criteria of creating value in external markets. What Vi Finance is going to be doing is they're creating a hedge fund based in Australia that allows people to get exposure to crypto, but in a custodial way, because that's what a lot of these hedge funds, that's, that's where they feel comfortable. They want it to be in a custodial, trusted nature. They want it to be built that way. And that's where this team come, comes from. They, they come from finance. They come from traditional finance sectors. They know what they're looking for. They know how to provide these services. And those fees that are generated through that hedge fund, those are going to be put into buybacks of the ViFi token, which means that the success of this value that is created in external markets, as well as the value that is created in the decentralized environment on the ViFinance Finance protocol, those are all going to pour into the ViFi token. That's going to contribute to buybacks of the ViFi token that'll be distributed to ViFi holders that are, that are staking to the platform. 
I am fully prepared and willing to take crap about this one because it doesn't matter if you believe me or not. The value that is created, at least through this hedge fund, uh, it's going to dump value into the Wi-Fi token, and it's a freaking $3 million market cap. That is, it's extraordinarily low, and, and the revenue is going to be put into that ecosystem. It's going to move. It's going to make money regardless of whether or not people actually buy the token. Now, a decentralized exchange does need liquidity to be able to handle any form of volume that is going to actually be stable enough to provide real, reliable trading. Uh, but I, I've heard that VIFI has some things in the works to be able to attract some additional people uh, coming to and using the platform. They're going to be improving the user experience. I know it's slow. It's going to get faster. But whatever, you know, these are just like very, very small things to be squabbling about when you realize the roadmap and the vision of what they've put together, the systems that they have designed to put in place, it, it's going to do well. The next token on our list is the EMP token provided by the Empower team. And it's a very simple and easy to understand utility. The Empower team takes money that they have accumulated, takes the assets that they have accumulated, and they use that to build houses out in Africa, even though each individual house is not as expensive as it would be in, in more modern countries, a lot of those different houses are still going to add up to create what my understanding is that it's a multi-billion dollar market out there. I think I read somewhere on the Empower website that it's a $1 trillion market, but uh, I couldn't find that article again, so I, I can't verify that that is... Uh, that is what they express, but I know that it's at the very least a multi-billion dollar market out there. From those houses that they build and sell, the, that revenue gets put back into the EMP token. So it's a, a very simple circular economy where they're able to build houses and those houses pour back into the Empower token. This team has a very deep understanding of decentralization, which I can really appreciate. And uh, yeah, this one doesn't fit the criteria of cross-chain expansion to be able to get access to more people in the crypto sphere so that people buy the token. But it does create value in external markets. It makes an impact on the world, and it's a pretty big industry that people underestimate. So this one is gonna do well. It's only a $4 million market cap. I, I swear, some of the market caps of a lot of these projects in the Cardano ecosystem is so stupid low, especially for the amount of impact that it makes and the value that it creates. They're going places. The, the value of them are practically next to zero at these current evaluations. And they're going to go places when people realize that, oh, there's actual real world impact that's being made here. So the Empower token, I end up placing that one in the A tier. The last token on our list is the Fluid Token from the Fluid Tokens team. Fluid Tokens is the best, the single best NFT lending platform in the Cardano ecosystem. It is the most used one in the Cardano ecosystem. I really like their developers. I like the product that they have produced. It works. It's, it's smooth. I think that it's a solid product, but... Uh, I it's an A tier product that I think lands in the C tier. Well, uh, let me correct that. The token lands in the C tier. The platform is A tier quality, but the token, I'm not really impressed by the utilities behind it. I think this is an issue that I've expressed a lot in this video. There's no active profit sharing mechanism, which means that there's no buy pressure. There's no revenue that is actually poured back into the token to create that buy pressure uh, so that the value of the token naturally goes up with the success of this product. It doesn't scale uh, in, in that sort of way. So the value of the token and the success of the platform is pretty disconnected. It seems like the primary utility behind it is that it's a reduction in fees. But like we talked about with the Dex Hunter protocol, either your fees are so ridiculously expensive that that is actually a desirable utility, 
or fees are pretty inexpensive and that utility isn't really all that desirable. Uh, unless you are making a ton of different trades, a ton of different transactions on this platform, and those fees are going to add up, um, unless that's the case, which I feel like isn't really the case with most crypto users, then th this one isn't really going to make a huge impact. It's not going to add a whole bunch of desirability to the token. Now, owning the Fluid token can also get you access to premium features on the platform or premium products that are implemented on this platform, but I don't know what that looks like yet, so I can't give them bonus points for what that utility actually is, or if it would be something that's worth paying for on any massive scale. Uh, so that could change if the utilities, if these premium features are actually that desirable, but but we'll see. And, and then the other uh, utility to it is that you get airdrops. Who knows what those airdrops are going to look like? Who knows which projects are actually going to contribute to those airdrops? And if that's even actually going to be a desirable value proposition. Uh, so I'm, I'm unimpressed with the utilities. Now, the Fluid Tokens uh, does kind of meet my criteria of going cross-chain, but the problem is that only the tokens are cross-chain, so you can actually get Fluid Tokens on SushiSwap right now, but the protocols are entirely on the Cardano blockchain, unless like that's going to be changing sometime soon, uh, which means that those, those ETH-based tokens don't actually have any utility to them unless they bridge over or unless protocols are extending to the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, and, and the other big problem with that expansion and the reason that I don't really give it uh, much credit for that cross-chain expansion is because <laughs> NFT lending in the greater cryptocurrency space is so ridiculously competitive. There are at least 50 other NFT lending products that exist in mainstream crypto that, that have people's attention before Fluid Tokens ever gets there. So there is a big, massive, competitive issue there that they've got to uh, be able to really stand out. And I don't think that these utilities are doing them any favors in that area. Now, this token is is worth like a $5 million market cap. So uh, it's it's already worth zero compared to mainstream crypto standards. Uh, I, I don't think that this thing is going to tank. I don't think that it's going to go to zero as with any of these products. People buy the most ridiculous crap out there. And, and there are projects out there that are verified scams. They're still able to maintain a $500 million market cap. So that's not going to be a problem here. But again, like, you know, I, I don't expect people to be flocking to this one because it gets drowned out by so much of the noise that uh, I'm, and, and it doesn't scale with the success of the platform. So yeah, I, I don't expect this one to take off. But that is going to do it for part two of my tier token list. And there's still many more projects out there that I have yet to evaluate and yet to uh, rank on, on my tier list. So yeah, you're going to be seeing a uh, part three, uh, probably a part four later into the future. Um, so let me know what projects you want to see rated down in the comments section below, or just leave your favorite emoji for the engagement. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell notification so you don't miss any of my Cardano-based content every Tuesday and Thursday. As always, remember never to invest more than what you can afford to lose. Learn as much as you can about this space and play for the late game. Thanks so much for watching.